Okay. So again, <laughs> sign up for the exam time by Monday, or let me know that you cannot make either of the dates. And I did post uh, ex practice exams, and next Friday will be sort of a, a practicing class day. So please look at those problems, and the best is if you actually look at them, and see what you think. <laughs> Think about them first, try to solve them yourself before you actually come to class for a reading session. Okay. Uh, now, let's get back to our programming. So last time around, we have introduced if, else, elif statements, meaning else if. So basically, they are decision trees of a program. Based, you typically want to make a decision and steer the program in one direction versus the other, uh, and basically, if LF statements allow you to do that. The general way they work is that there is if statement followed by expression, and this is where we evaluate something, okay? We have mentioned all of those relational operators. We're gonna check whether some level of something is larger than a threshold we need it to be, and we can pile up as many of those statements as it makes sense for our, uh, uh, for our task. And then after that, we put a colon, very important. This way, Python knows that there's a block of statements coming that it should execute in case the expression is true or evaluates is true. Okay? So we also have to indent those by four. And the moment you actually type in colon and get into the next line, <laughs> Jupyter Notebook at least, but most other Python environments will actually indent immediately. So don't buy it, indent, okay? However, the moment you're done with the if statements or the block of statements that is supposed to be executed, go back to the regular indentation. And that will execute independently of the if statement. You can, of course, say just if something is true, do something. Or you could actually have this, you could keep going. Else, if something else is true, keep going, and so forth. And we, we can have as many of these elif statements as, it's, uh, as it fits our purpose. Don't go too many because humans ultimately do have to read and check the code. Okay, so going too crazy is not uh, a good idea. Okay? And uh, basically, at the end, it's a very good idea to put an else statement that is a catch-all and give some sort of a warning or something that will happen regardless of all of the above statements being true or not. Okay? So note that if the first statement is true, the second one, nothing else will execute. Okay? So I will go into elif statement only if the first one failed. And same goes for all of the subsequent ones. And this else, I will get to it only if everything else failed about it. Okay? So everything else evaluated as false about that. Okay? And then that's my sort of a catch-all and gives me possibly a warning that that has happened, and maybe I need to look at the code again. Okay. So we had an exercise that you were supposed to submit to input the number from keyboard, determine whether the number is even or odd, and inform us about it by printing on the screen. And here's my solution for it. So basically, you input, you use input to get or collect answer from a user. That answer is always stored into a string. So if you check the type of the answer, it's going to actually evaluate as a string plot. And then you have to convert it to an integer, which if a number was typed in, Python will do with no problem. If some sort of a text was typed in, typed in, then there will be a problem. Okay. And then I check whether reminder during division by two is one equals equal basically checks whether something is equal. If I only have one equal sign, that's an assignment. It's not checking whether something is true. So there's a different difference between one equal sign and two. Okay? And then if the, the reminder with the division is one, you print that the number is odd. Otherwise, you print that it's even. There are these column statements here 
give or take, Python just ignores them. In my typing, they're sort of just remnant of programming in all other languages. <laughs> and some of them have them as mandatory, which is C and C++, that's how I started. <coughs> MATLAB has them as optional. If you put one in, then no, nothing will be printed as a result of a command, which is useful not to have too much print up. So I still use it <laughs> there. But in Python, it doesn't really matter. So if you see if it's there, if it's not, it doesn't matter. And it's not a mistake either way. OK? All right. So now we will switch on to something else that, is, that allows us to uh, uh, do more powerful stuff. And I've been mentioning that since the very beginning of the class. What computers are very good at is repeating things. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Million times is necessary. <coughs> Way better at it than any human I know. Okay. So basically, we need some sort of a structure that will tell Python to repeat something. Now, in that process, we will have two options. The first one will be simply, OK, we need some sort of counting. So if you were on the track, somebody would be sitting here and counting how many laps you did. Or maybe you would be doing that. There's somebody counting. So we need to figure out how to let computer know to count, okay? And give some sort of a range of values to go down. It's pretty flexible. It can be any range of anything, okay? And we will go through some of the examples. But general statement or syntax is for, we call that the for loop, for some index or a counter in some range. And I can give it an expression on how to evaluate that range. Or I can literally give it a list of numbers. Okay. List of our numbers, numpy, list of numbers that's actually an array of uh, same uh, numerical, uh, same type of numerical values. Anything really works. I can really type in a list of a bunch of strings. That will work too. So it's very flexible. But it has to have some certain range that has you know beginning and end. So it can go through one by one, and then depending on that index, I'm going to execute a block of statements, and that block of statements typically depends on what the index is. Okay, so in the program, we're going to have something like that. And same thing as before, I'm going to let Python know that these block of statements that is belonging to this for loop is with the colon, and then I have to indent it with the colon. Otherwise, it doesn't belong to for loop and it's going to get executed anyway separately. Okay. We're going to have also a while loop. While loop says while some expression is true. Maybe I don't know how many times something will happen. While you have enough power, <laughs> run. So that might be five laps, six laps, one lap, no laps, no right? So while something is true, that might be actually dynamic and changing in your program you do, again, a block of statements. So they're kind of, just like you would think, they're like logically different. For loop, I know precisely what needs to be done and how many times, and I have a way to count it. And in while loop, I have to dynamically check whether something is true as I'm doing things. Okay? So basically, you will choose the, the loop accordingly. Typically, you can force one or the other to become the other but you will just choose based on how you logically think about the problem. Okay? Or I will ask you specifically to use one or the other. All right. So let's actually just go open up Python and, or Jupyter Notebook, and we're going to practice these. Once it's open. The computer says, it's Friday. Give me a break. All right.
I need to navigate to my Gonna do a new one. And I'm gonna call this lecture 3.1 control flow. Because I'm trying to control the flow of the program. So let's first figure out hey, how do I give myself a range of numbers? And good news is there is actually a very useful tool. A utility called range and I can give myself let's give it a try typically I give it a starting point and an ending point and it's going to return a list of integers oh it doesn't want to print it okay So here I'm, I'm calling my index i, and for i in this range of numbers, and we're going to see what the range is when it prints it, just print that number, just let it see what it is. I'm not telling it to do anything else. But my for statement has the following syntax. I have a for, and Jupyter is recognizing it, it's printing it as this green color. This i, you can call it anything. I could have called it index. i is just shorter to type. In is another keyword that is recognized. This range of numbers, I could have just typed in range of 1, 5. And then colon, and now it's expecting a block of statements. That block is really simple. It has one statement. So for i being the first element in this list, which is 1, it printed it, it's 1. For i is the second, so it then goes down the second one, and then it prints it, because that's the only thing I'm asking it to do. Then third one, then fourth. Yes? So my range is really 1, 2, 3, 4. And this range function returns from starting point to ending point, but it doesn't include the ending point. Don't you love that about Python? And counters are often integers, so this is really helpful. I can now change A, and I'm going to simply overwrite what this first one is. I can start from 1 to 5. And I'm going to step by 2. Let's see what we get. 1. 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 plus 2 is 5, but that's equal to 5, which is my ending point, so it's not going to take it into account. Okay. If I want 5 on this list, then I could put 6 here. I could put 56, but that's a lot of numbers. Okay. I can also say is range of, if I just want to shorten my writing, I could put range of 6, and then it's going to start with 0. And it's not going to give me the 6, but the smallest, uh, the, the one smaller integer than six. I could also go down, not all counting goes up. 
So I could say it from six down to two and step by minus two. Let's, let's try that. What should it be? What do you think? Can you write down on a piece of paper or some sort of side thing? Uh, side piece of software. <laughs> <laughs> write down and then let's check whether it's really what you expect it to be. Or you can just type it in here. I expect six and so forth on this list. So type it down for yourself and then let's test it just to have fun. It's always good to anticipate, to check your understanding and to prevent any errors. So write it down for yourself what it is that you expect. You think two will be on the list? Let's try. No, because it's that end point, even though it's smaller. <clears throat> so again, range gives me a list of integers, whether they're going up or going down or stepping. That's the most useful counter. So basically, range function gives a range of integers that is very useful for indexing of for loops. Indexing. There we go. Excellent. Now, our best friends are NumPy arrays, right? Right? Right. So at least they're my best friend, and you, you can think about it. So I can use a NumPy array. Doesn't, doesn't matter. That's a good. So for any kind of floating point counters, you can't use integers for some reason. You might want to use those. So we can just say, oh, my range. Uh, range, look at me. NP. Lin space from 0 to 0 0.5 and give me four values. <laughs> oh, print. I, not A. <laughs> Printed. On the second thought, this is a little nicer choice. <laughs> Just nicer numbers to print. Okay, so I can use for floating points for loop can take np arrays as range of indices as well. Did everybody get to try this? You can try a range, you can try any other function that you'd like for this range of numbers that makes sense. So for instance, I could have said, uh-huh, well, um, we can do another example, like A is NP, let's do a range just for the heck of it from 0 to np pi and step with np pi divided by 5. Okay. 
So arrange once your delta or difference between two points. And I say, hey, go to pi and step by pi over 5. And I can print, well, uh, NP cosine of I. I can do with it whatever it is that I'd like with that index. And actually, these indices are so indiscriminate <coughs> that I could create uh, my collection A as a list it is Friday, and today is October 4th, so I'm just going to add add 10 and 4 to this list. So I have a collection of three strings and two numbers. And I have mentioned before, this is a list. It's not a NumPy array. It's a list. So it can be a list of anything. And I can even combine different types. Okay. This, is, this is a, a list with different types. Well, print command works with that, so I can still say for i in a, print i. And it's going to do it. It's not going to question me. Computers are good at repeating. They're not necessarily good at questioning your wisdom. If you want them to question your wisdom, you got to program them to question your wisdom. It's not necessarily always a bad idea. And we program them to question our wisdom with if else, right? <laughs> or if else. Okay. So it can be, again, a list, so a list is the, using these brackets. Okay, now let's do actually something useful. Typically, so this is just, this print command just gave us the notion of what the range of indices could be. Most of the time, and this is going to be one of your first examples, is to Come up with the sum of something, for instance, or go over a range of values and add them up, calculate something with them that is a little more involved than just printing them. Okay. And for that, we have to learn how to do that. Okay, and I'm going to just quickly switch to my slides. So here is one example. I can create myself any array, but maybe it's some array that I want to, uh, that I work with, okay? And then I actually want to go over those numbers in the array, index them somehow, so I can refer to them, okay? And for instance, sum them up in the very simplest of the applications. This sum will change as I go through the array. I will go, give me a number. Four. So I either initiate this sum with four, or maybe I think in advance and initiate it with zero. And then I say zero plus four is four. Now give me a number. So now I'm indexing and I'm moving forward. And she says two, so the second element of the array is two, then I'm going to add four plus two, that's six. My sum is changing to six within the for loop. Then I move forward, give me a number. You know this. This was coming, right? Yeah. <laughs> 12. 12. 12 plus, he wants to stretch me this Friday, okay? 12 plus 6 is 18, and I keep going. So my list goes as long as my array is. But again, 
computer doesn't know you're about to do summation and store it into something. So you have to tell it. You have to initialize values that you're about to compute. <coughs> so your first thing is to have the array of numbers coming from somewhere. And second thing is to initialize and keep updating this sum that you want to compute. Okay. So this is what this program is doing. First is going to give, I'm just giving myself an array, a lean space from 0 to 100. It doesn't matter what, what array is, it's going to be a really large sum. Okay. And then I say if the sum of x's is 0, this is my initialization. And then I have to figure out how to walk through this array. Since it's an ordered array, I know they start from 0. I cannot start from 1, I'm going to miss the initial one. right? So they start from zero, so I'm going to give myself a range of zero. I can either figure out how many are there, or I can just say length of x. Length, L-E-N, gives me a length of the array. That's number of elements. And in that range, this, is where this range function is useful. I'm going to in the loop, and there is a color missing here. This is a PowerPoint, it's not an actual program. Okay. And then sum x will update. It will take the old value of sum x and add the new one. And this is this dynamic change inside the for loop. Every time my for loop to comes to a different number, this will change okay, within that for loop. And let me just type in this colon that is important. So let's try it out. So basic summation. So in basic summation, I'm going to do, give myself an array, and I'm going to go with something smaller so I don't have a super large sum. I can still give myself 50 numbers. And this summation is initialized with zero. I gotta start with something. Computer doesn't know on its own that it that's what you wanna do. And for either i or k, I'm just gonna use k just to be different from the previous one. It doesn't matter what you name this index. Zero to length of x will give me precisely the range I need. If I have 50 of them, it's going to be really 50. But this is better programming because I might change my mind and then I don't know it's always 50. So hard coding 50 in there is not a good idea. Using len of x is a better idea because it kind of changes with your x. You change x, it will change accordingly. Does everybody get that? And then colon and update the sum x is sum x plus, so my previous value, plus x of k. <laughs> and let's print this sum. If not, I actually have to run to give a pretty important presentation, so I'm going to stop lecture here, but Thatcher is staying here with you, and you will work. These are examples that are available on line, and I want you to solve these first two problems Specifically, 
actually no, let's do one and three. And in three, this big thing here is multiplication. So I want you to multiply things. So do a product of numbers. And you will have to initialize it with which number? One. Don't initialize with zero because your product will be zero. Don't need to go through four loops for that. So you can also just simply work with any with this pro uh, summation example to convert it to a product. Okay. okay. So these additional exercises are slide 17 in your loop. So basically create any x and the first problem is sum over all indices i xi squared and the second one create two arrays one is zero, uh, no uh, create work with the same x that you want to create up there and then do i times x of i so this is a product product sum these are greek letters by the way p and sigma okay so product and sum of all of the elements or some calculation with these elements. Again, so Thatcher will walk around and we will create in-class exercise. So you will have to submit these two problems for uh, quiz grade tonight. Okay? Okay. And I see you on Monday.